want to start a, a, a conversation today, a series that'll be at least three weeks long, maybe longer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it uh, For Us, as in God is for us. And over the next three weeks, for sure, I want to talk about different aspects of this because I've discovered that one of the questions that have come across the ages, as far back as we can tell within Scripture and as far back as we can tell within human history, there's a question mark around whether or not God is actually for us. People will joke, but it really reveals the insecurity they have when you invite them to church and they say, well, I, I would come, but I don't want to get struck by lightning. All right, I'd come to church with you, but I don't want the, burning, the, you know, the, the, the building to burn down. You know, they're joking but revealing that they're not sure that God's really for them. You might invite somebody who's yet to follow Jesus or commit to a faith journey, and so they might say, well, I don't go to church because I'm not a Christian. And I want to tell you, if that's you today, we have a philosophy here that we're committed to, that believers is a place where you can belong even before you believe. Meaning that you can, you can come, you can listen, you can observe, and as the Lord leads you and as the Holy Spirit shows you how good he is, you can respond to his provision, his blessing, and ultimately his salvation. I commit each week to, to reviewing the words that I use. If I wanted to, I could use all my fancy uh, Bible school terminology, and I might sound super studious and smart to you, but that's not going to do us any good if you're impressed by me, but never really experienced the depth uh, of the life-giving power of the scriptures. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So the onlooking world, those who have yet to encounter Jesus, there's this cloud that kind of hovers that whether or not God really is for us, and where it gets really bad, and where it becomes more harmful, especially to those who have yet to encounter Jesus, is when the saints of God are questioning whether or not God is for us or not. That orphan-heartedness, that, that concern of whether or not God actually is for us can keep us from experiencing the abundant life that's promised to us. It's more than just making heaven, it's experiencing eternal life right now. And so this actually began all the way back to the garden. I want to start in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman, Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Not at all. No, we can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, Don't eat from it. Don't even touch it or you'll die. And the serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, that you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. And when the woman saw that the tree looked like it was good eating and realized what she would get out of it, she'd know everything, she took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband, and he did eat. The serpent came along to question Eve or to plant the seed of doubt. Is God holding out on you? Is, is God really for you after all? Because he told her that if you eat it, well, then you'll really see what's going on, as if God was keeping something from her. If you, if you eat it, you're going to be just like God, as if she already wasn't just like God. The question that was established from the beginning and what we wrestle with in humanity today is the same question over and over. Is God holding out on you? Is God really for you? And so there's been this human effort, this human drive to answer that question. Is God, in fact, really for for me. And out of that, we've seen many different traditions established. We watched hierarchies and even different sects within uh, religious traditions, um, elitism among others, because we, we have this question mark. If, if God is for us and they're doing this, well, if I do a little bit more, certainly then I get the golden star. Certainly then I could be reassured that God is actually for me. The problem with this, and we can see it played out throughout history, is that it puts the focus in the wrong space. 
It puts it all on I, if I, when I, instead of him and what he has already done. In Mark chapter 9, I'm not going to read the, the chapter, but I think you should make sure to write this down if it's not in your notes so you can double check that I'm not perverting the story. But the story goes like this. Jesus comes into a community and he comes upon a young man who's born blind. And the disciples, because there's this, there's this uh, wrong focus, they ask Jesus the question, so was it him or was it his mom and dad that sinned that he's blind? And Jesus said, it's neither. It's neither one. The, the, this is for God's power and for God's glory. And I don't fully understand all of what was going on there, but the question that came out of the disciples was, there must have been someone who did something wrong, so that's why he's blind. And Jesus said, no. So he goes over to the young man, and he pulls off one of his most spectacular miracles. He could have just prayed. He could have just spoke to him, but no. No, Jesus spits in the dirt, puts a little mud in the guy's eyeballs, <laughs> says, go out there, wash your eyes, and, and uh, you'll be well. And that's exactly what transpired. He got mud put in his eyes, gets cleaned, cleaned up, he can see, goes to the religious leaders, tells the religious leaders that he can see. And they're like, wait a minute, who, who, did, who, who did this? They were less concerned that this boy could see and more concerned with, why would a rabbi heal somebody on the Sabbath? Talk about missing the point, right? So they're drilling him. Well, what did he do? What did he say? Who is this guy? And the guy's like, look, I don't, I don't know. All I know is that I was blind and he put mud in my eyes. I washed it out and I could see. And they're like, nah, we don't believe you. There's no way. And I'm telling you, they're looking through the lens of all that they do for God because of their religious piety and this man who did nothing gets a miracle like this. If anyone's getting miracles around here, it's going to be me, right? Free me your parents. Well, his parents are freaked out. They're like, man, I, I don't want to be on the wrong side of this. So that they kick me out of the community. And so they're drilling him. And they're like, look, all I can tell you is that he really was born blind. And, and, and they don't believe the parents that the kid was born blind. So they bring him back in. They're drilling him even more. And the funniest part is he finally just says, stop. I don't know what to tell you. I can tell you this. I was blind, and now I see. We have this propensity, or this, this affinity, rather, for searching for disqualifiers. It's the human condition. We, we want to we see that we tend to be, I don't say we want to, I don't know if any of us really want to, but we have this gravitational pull towards why they shouldn't, or this couldn't, or why I can't, or why God wouldn't. It's this, this, this affinity towards what disqualifies us. And this message then permeates from the local church into the community, and we end up painting this picture of a God who's short-tempered and a perfectionist. It gets worse. I mean, we start, we start getting into this imagery that God's some kind of a terrorist who can't wait to eradicate the very people that he created, and we just celebrated the fact that he died for. Why would he do that? Why would the God of, of love, out of his own image, create humanity be so disgusted with his perfect creation that he wants to get rid of them, why would he send his only son to die for them in such a brutal way and yet want to make it so fragile for you and I and find ways where he can get you out the house? Hey, moms, for example, uh, you, you moms kind of carry more of the burden when it comes to bringing our young ones into the planet, right? Husbands, nod your head. Yes, the, <laughs> yes honey, you carry the burden. And I just wonder how many moms would be quick to kick a baby to the curb or a young child to the curb because they didn't have it all done just right or perfect. And if you think that you wouldn't do that, but God does, that means that you're saying that God is better than you. Jesus fixed this imagery for us. I believe the, the cross tells us that God, my God, your God is a Messiah, not a monster. And that should be the message that we preach to ourselves that continues on out of this place because that was the aim and the message of Jesus. If we're not careful, church, we will start getting so disqualifying minded that we will assign things to the characteristics of Jesus that don't belong to Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse number 10, Jesus said, the thief's purpose, someone say purpose, He's going to tell you the purpose of the thief. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Then he goes on to give us the answer to what is his purpose. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. 
One translation says, I've come that they might have life and life in abundance. The thief is the one who came to kill, steal, and destroy. Please do not assign these type of evil deeds to Jesus when he told you his purpose was to come, that you and I, everyone, could have life and life in abundance. Now, this translation says thieves. Other translations say the enemy. And it would be easy to think that this word simply is being assigned to the Satan, which is fair because he is one of your enemies. But you'll discover that the word thieves here, used within the New Testament, is a, is a word that is a name transferred over to false teachers who, are, who, are, who, uh, who do not care to instruct men, but abuse their confidence for their own gain. Meaning that if you receive the voice of the enemy, the thieves, over the voice of what Jesus said, they're now becoming an enemy to your faith. That's external. But my guess is, more often than not, the voice of the thief, the enemy, is coming from you, and you become your worst enemy. We need to be reminded routinely that Jesus is for us, and he's not only for us, he wants us to experience his life and have it in abundance. In 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses, I envision John like a lawyer, like a trial lawyer, who's, who's, who's making this case in front of the jurors. He's talking from first-hand knowledge, first-hand experience. In 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we've heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. The one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Let me just pause here before I continue to read. John says, look, we saw him. We lived with him. We touched him. We experienced him. We can testify that he is the word of life. He is the eternal son of God. And we're telling you this. We're, we're, we're sharing this with you. Watch this. So that you can also experience the fullness of joy. I'm telling you, church, if your message, what comes out of your mouth, your business activities, your life, your social media, your neighborhood, if it doesn't leave the person feeling joy, you may not be focusing on the right Jesus. Because Jesus, or John said, all of this information, everything that we've experienced, we're sharing it with you, not so that you're terrified of God. We're not telling you this so that you can get into heaven. We're not telling you this so that you can escape hell. We're telling you this so that you can experience and share the joy that is overflowing in our lives. I'm telling you, when the church catches a hold of that, not just believers, the church, the body of Christ, it'll be like a wild fire. I'm telling you, the, Jesus was a magnet to broken, lost, immoral people. They wanted joy. They needed joy. They wanted life. Let's keep reading. This is the message we heard from Jesus, and now we declare to you, God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth, but we are living in the light as God is in the light. Then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay, I think this is a powerful statement. He first off says in verse number five that God is light, and in him there is no darkness, what? At all. No darkness. And if you're in the light, 
He says, it's because you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But there's a powerful word here. It says, and, and, uh, let me go back here, and fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus. Now, if you know me, if you've been around here for a little bit, y'all know that one of my least favorite words in the world is the word fellowship. I don't know what it is about it. It's just so churchy and cringy to me. I hate it. It doesn't work outside of church world, right? I mean, think about a couple of guys who just got off GM and they're heading to the restaurant to have a, a drink and, and dinner together. Hey, want to go to, want to, go to the, 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 the restaurant and fellowship? Right? <laughs> who talks like that? You know, it's like, for me, it's like fellowship, glitter, <laughs> speed limits, you know? <laughs> I'll give you that. Now, that being said, I decided to give fellowship a chance because it shows up so many times. And John says, look, it's about fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus that our sins, that our sins are cleansed. It caused me to become emotional when I saw that the word fellowship here is the Greek word koinonia. And it's the same word used in the relationship that we have with the Father. No barriers. No separation. Oneness with the Father. That his desire is not just to have that access this way, but because we've been given that access, he wants us to have fellowship one with another. And that doesn't mean just those who are in the club, those that are in the church. It's one another. It's powerful. This word koinonia is also used. What, what brings us together, the, the, some of the examples that were given were if you were a brother and sister, a blood brother and sister, born, born from the same parents, what you have in common, this is, uh, you can't take that away. It's your brother and sister or your brothers. And, or, it, you can't change that. If you're an American, whether you were born here or you, you're a citizen here, what we share together, we're part of that. And so what God has ex- made access to you, he's made access to all. For darkness to succeed... You see, in him is light, and in him there is no darkness. And for darkness to succeed, darkness somehow has to look like virtue. It is possible to be in Jesus and still operate in darkness if we don't understand this. There's activities that have been produced from Christians or religious people that look virtuous, but they're terribly harmful. It leaves you blind to your own illusions and convinced that you see perfectly. This, one, this one's hard for me. I'm 45 years old, and so I'm, I'm probably in the middle of the age range of people in our church. And there are some of you that have me by decades, and it doesn't matter if you're twice my age or you are the world wrecking record breaker, 125-year-old person. And you've been walking with Jesus, and you've been going to church, and you've been studying your Bible, and you've gone to Bible school training. Listen, I don't care if you've been alive for 125 years or 500 years. In the light of eternity, do you really think you could achieve the space of knowing all there is to know about God? All there is to know about Scripture? How arrogant of us to act like we have the corner market on something. As if well, the way that we see it, the way that we do it is the right way. And all those other churches are false. Be very, very careful. Because the moment you think you see it perfectly, you have switched over from confidence right into arrogance. This is terrible for our ability to serve others and to represent Jesus well. This is all at the heart of the problem. The church has been advocating facelifts when heart transplants are what is needed. What's that look like, Pastor Phil? Well, I'll tell you what I think it looks like. We kind of want you to clean up a little bit. In fact, we, we want you to look a little bit different before we call you a friend. We kind of want you to look different before they see us together in public. I kind of want to put some lipstick on that thing and maybe camouflage a little bit of this because if, if they see that you're doing something a little bit better, it makes me look a little bit better. That's why I think it would be so much easier if I pastored a church about the size of this section right here. Because we could weed out all the imperfect people. No offense to everybody else in the room. You know what I mean? Like, like as a pastor... 
there, there's a real pressure in people out in the community not perfectly representing what Jesus would do. Because when you're out there shining like a gold star Christian, I can stick my chest out. <laughs> yeah, they go to my church. And there's a lot of pastors that live on that edge. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to be out there doing stupid things and misrepresenting believers or Jesus. Probably <laughs> other order. Misrepresenting Jesus and believers. Let's make, make that distinction. Ezekiel 36 the prophet began to speak of this, that it's not about changing your outward behavior and, and, and still not having an inward change because the outward behavior, that conformity is temporal. But internal change leads to transformation. I'll give you a new heart. Put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone of heart from your body and replace it with a heart that's God-willed, not self-willed. I'll put my spirit in you and make it possible for you to do what I tell you and live by my commandments. You know, if we look at somebody who's yet to encounter Jesus and we tell them that we want you to start doing the Jesus stuff, we want you to, to start acting like Jesus, living like Jesus, it's actually very cruel of us because we're asking them to do something they're not empowered to do yet. And they'll, they'll try, we've all tried, but I'll just tell you this, the Christian life is not just hard. The Christian life is impossible. And you can't do it with a facelift. It takes a heart transplant. Talking about this a little bit further, Paul writes in Galatians 4, 6, again, talking about the heart of a man or woman. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Abba is the Greek word that means uh, very similar to an English word that we would say, Daddy is super affectionate. The son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own children. And since you are his children, God has made you his heir. The spirit of his son. What does that look like? Well, we, we believe that Jesus and the father are one. That's what Jesus taught us. And that the spirit of his son would be the spirit of God in you. So that now would be the, the heart transplant, the, the new operating system that's been given to you, not the other way around. You can't earn it, deserve it, clean up enough to get it. You have to receive it for free as a gift. And as you do, you begin to live and operate from a di different motivation and a different power system. So what, what does this look like? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, notice in these two verses how many times the word love is used. In two times, you're going to see five, in two verses, five times that the word love shows up. Dear friends, so John is writing to the church, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love, does not know God, for God is love. Notice the progression. It starts with God. God's love gets in you, and out of you, love comes out of you. This word love, five times, same Greek word, agape. It means to be affectionate. It means benevolent. It means goodwill, and it means charitable. If you are walking with Jesus, I sure hope that you know that God has been benevolent to you. My prayer is that you understand the word charitable, charis, comes from the same word, grace. He's been gracious to you. That God's good will was shown to you. We just celebrated that last weekend by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if the love of God that has been given unto you benevolently charitably, his goodwill has been poured out on you. It is not for you to be the recipient only, but if you really have experienced love, then love comes out of you. Meaning that having fellowship one with another is this way, it's also out there where God is gracious, benevolent, charitable, has goodwill. Remember, Jesus was God's idea. God so loved the world, right? That he gave 
And so when we look through the, the, these two passages about love, we're, it's revealing what you've received if you're walking with him. If you've yet to encounter Jesus, you're going to have opportunity. My prayer is that today changes everything. But as we walk from this place, it's not about just the ooey gooey goosebumps from worship, which is great. But if that's all it is, you're a spectator, not a participant. Church becomes an event, not who you are. And so it stays here for you to pick up next week. That's not God's plan. His, his grace, his, his love, his benevolence, his goodwill goes with us because as, as Pastor Steve said perfectly, we are the living temples of God. We just gather under a place to worship. 1 Corinthians 13, usually pulled out during weddings. We call this the love chapter. I've done this before, but this helps to give us a little insight of what God looks like because If God is love, and we believe he is love, then what if we exchanged every time that Paul uses love in this with God? What if we read it like God is patient and kind? God is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. God does not demand his own way. God is not irritable, and he keeps no record of being wronged. God does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. God never gives up. God never loses faith. God always is hopeful and do, endures through every circumstance. That's love. That's God. That's what he's done for us. He is for us. And when we believe that, then we can go from this place and let other people know that he's really for us. Amen. Amen. So what set us off? What got us off course? I've I've said this before. It's worth repeating. What set us on the wrong path was making the object of our faith ideas and doctrines instead of the person, Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute because some people have this, this idea to see what's not being said more than what's being said. I didn't say that doctrine isn't important. I'm not saying ideas and theology isn't important. But when it's all about doctrines and theologies and knowledge and information, you can know a lot about the Bible and never let the Bible get into you. You can know a lot about Jesus and never really know him. You can have uh, proximity to his presence without actually involving him into your life. So what's important here and what keeps us on track is that the focus is not doctrine, it's not ideas, It's on Jesus himself. It was Jesus that not only impressed people by what he knew, but by what he said, what he did. You remember, people were shocked. I'm like, who is this guy with all this authority and all this knowledge? But it was more than just knowledge. They had plenty of knowledge. In fact, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were elite in their academics in regards to religious law and tradition. And yet, They use knowledge for the purpose of ego enhancement, shaming, and control of people. Jesus did not come to the world and model for us a religious mindset. Jesus came to the world and modeled for us a kingdom mindset. Kingdom-minded people use knowledge for transformation of persons, structures, systems, and especially themselves. So how did Jesus model a kingdom mindset? I wrote down just a few to consider. He did so with nonviolence. He did it with simple lifestyle, a love for the poor, for forgiveness. Jesus did it with love for enemies, inclusivity, and he did it with mercy. Jesus showed us and modeled for us what a kingdom mindset was with not seeking status, not seeking power, not seeking perks, and not seeking possessions. If you have a religious mindset, then you're more concerned with about being right than you are helping. This is a, a terrible statement because it's so true. Blaise Pascal once said, men never do evil so completely or cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. Some of the worst and darkest things to ever happen to humanity came from religious people thinking that this is what God thought and this is what they should be doing. The Apostle Paul was rescued in the midst of terrorizing people of the way. 
It could be said that the opposite of love is hate, but I want to submit to you that the opposite of love is evil. The root word there for evil is found in the Latin language, mal, M-A-L, or mal, and it means bad or evil. The word dismal, for example, is derived from the Latin meaning evil day. A malice person does not think twice about performing evil deeds to hurt other people. A malefactor or evil doer is the opposite of a benefactor. Someone who is a maleficent fully intends to do evil. And the worst example of all, when you malign another, you say evil things about him. That is, you act in a magnolent or evil fashion. Love does not terrorize people or speak ill of the ones that God loves so much that he sent his son for. If we're not careful, even as believers, we can act evil towards people that God saw fit to die for. Jesus shows up for you because he is for you. Final passage, Proverbs 18, 24. Some friendships don't last for long, but there's one loving friend who's joined to your heart closer than any other. If you really want to know who's for you, pay attention to the people who show up at your best and in your blunder. Please be reminded, Paul said, Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I left out the opening part of that. He loved us and he showed it to us by getting engaged at our worst. All of us have had blunders in our lives, sin, mistakes, error, and not every one of them were, were, oops, I tripped over that thing. All of us have calculated, all of us have meditated, all of us have thought and fallen short. The battle that we have is in these moments when we've tripped up again, we've made the wrong decision again. We've, we've been at the altar, we've been up in the middle of the night, sitting before our, on our knees next to our bed, praying out to God, the infamous, God, if you help me now, I'll never. If, you will, if you'll fix this, I promise I will. And maybe you've done it 10 times or 100 times. And you're questioning whether or not if God is for me, because certainly I've wore him out on all my promises that I didn't keep. And I'll go back to what I said in the beginning of the message. The promise of God is not based on you and what you can keep and your promise. The promises of God and the covenant of God is established on his promise and what he's done for us. And it's on his word, his name, what he said, what he did. Now we can know for sure that he is for us. Amen. We have to have that so ingrained in us, church. Because you are having encounters with Jesus. You're students of his scriptures. How much more those who have never been exposed to any of that. They need to be exposed to you. The ones that are loved by him. That have the spirit of his son in you. Not just the benefactor of his graciousness. But you also give it away. Would you stand with me? I want to pray with you. And I, want to, I know I've gone over just a couple minutes. But I... I really feel like there's a moment here that we've got to hold. We've got to grab it. We've got to grab it. We don't want to miss it. I think there are two primary categories of people. There are, there are, I'm speaking to the saints of God, those that are walking with Jesus. And you can relate. You, you question, you wonder, you beat yourself up. Can God really be for me? Because I know better. I, I knew better. I'm still wrestling with this thing. And, or whatever it is, I find myself off in the weeds. Is God for me? The answer is yes. And the fact that you're here hearing me say this, it should be a divine uh, confirmation to you to remind you that God is for you. And you need to simply say, yes, I, I believe that. I believe that the accuser, the enemy is the one who came into my life, who tries to come into my life to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus is the one who came that you might have life and life in abundance. The other category of individual 
however you landed here, whatever, whatever circumstances led up to this, I don't believe it's a mistake. I believe that God has divinely orchestrated us to be here because some of you have, have either had a perceived idea of a cosmic bully who can't wait to eradicate you. And so why in the world would I go to a place that promotes that over my life when I'm already afraid of it? Or maybe you've had a misrepresentation in your life. A preacher, a priest, another Christian or religious person has misrepresented Jesus. Please don't blame Jesus for frailty of humanity. Jesus is perfect theology. And he will walk with you. He will show you that he will earn that trust, even though he's been trustworthy from the beginning. He's doing everything possible for each one of us to know that in our hearts. So if, if you would allow me, please, just close your eyes across this room. I'm not setting anybody up. I just want to pray. So Father, across this room, may every heart be reassured. May every mind be put at ease. May every person, saints and sinners alike, may we come to the knowledge and the revelation of your goodness, your rescue, and your love. May every hindering thought, every broken promise, every sin decision, every falling short uh, moment of your life be laid down and we draw the line in the sand and we repent, meaning we turn away from that and we put our faith, our confidence. We're persuaded that God is who he said he is and Jesus showed us who God is and he's here today to woo our hearts to a place of surrender. There's no hoops or ladders to climb. It's a simple yes or a yielding. And if in your heart you say, yes, Jesus, he'll swell every space that you'll give him. And I just, I see people with their hands on their hearts. I see people's lives. I'm watching your countenances change. This is beautiful. Father, be glorified. Help us to know you better. Help us to experience you in a way that's so profound that others can't help but need to know who we are because they see Jesus in us. More than this moment on a Sunday morning, Father, I pray that your empowerment by your spirit leads us out of this place to a whole new way of living, operating under a new power and a new source, reminded again whose we are. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.